We're about to do our second lecture of uh, the day in this hall. Um, it's uh, called Transhuman Expression. And it uh, deals with interdisciplinary research in painting and robotics. It's um, at first guided by a professor who is not here currently, Olive, Oliver Doshin. Do I? Yes, Doshin. And here next to me, I have uh, the PhD candidate uh, Marvin Gulzov. Yes, and the artist, the one who is working with these robots, Layat Kreiler. Yes? Okay, um, they will discuss both uh, the technical challenges that go along and the innovation aspects that go along in the development of an E. David robot. I understood the robot is there since quite some years yet, but it's always in development. And what I see then somewhere in the future is probably that we can imagine the old fashioned serious painters of like a Rubens or Rembrandt or Van Dijk. Uh, they who had ateliers with, uh, filled up with assistants who were very skilled in certain specific uh, aspects. But imagine then someone like Andy Warhol and his factory or so that's got, that would be working in a robotized world. And I think these people are going to show us or demonstrate us the challenges that are in there. Because next to that kind of uh, understanding of working with robots as assistants, we have to look as well at the social and artistic practice um, that this way of working actually offers us. Um, they do not go on strike, I presume. They take sometimes a break, and you have to take, yeah, take care about them. Are they female? That's my first question. No. I think David is fairly... Uh masculine name given by Oliver Doyson. So. Yeah, it's still masculine. Okay, <laughs> guys, are you ready for this? Uh, then I would say light the fuse and put it in play. Let's go. robot is recording every brushstroke it has done, we can always take those brushstrokes and repeat them. We can repeat them and shuffle them and use them in different ways. It's a variation of repetition of something that is so minor and barely seen that make it, I think, to be something that the, the viewer's subconscious will, will recognize it, but our conscious not part will not directly see it. And I think that could be a very, very interesting um, effect to play with. I can try to play around with this completely abstract painting, but at the same time as image-oriented painting, where I have exactly the same amount of brushstrokes, exactly the same kind of brushstrokes, but they each time going to be put in a different way. Just the orientation will be a bit different. Uh, the location with which one was under and which one is above will change. And this is uh, an idea that, was, um, that I'm really looking into is the, the concept of entropy in painting. Because the idea of just how chaos is increased in an organized body. So each time that I'm actually making a variation, I wanted to increase the level of, of chaos in it. But it's still, in order to function as a system, the painting as a system, it has to still hold some kind of logic behind that. And this logic is very hard to control a thing from the human mind, but you can actually use a computer to help you to create it. We built this painting machine, E. David, almost seven years ago. I'm, I'm working in computer graphics for more than 20 years now and a part of computer graphics is what we call non-photorealistic rendering. 
to produce images, computer images that look like uh, done by an artist. At a certain point, I had the idea not just to produce computer images, but to draw, to build a machine that uh, mimics what an artist does. And that was the, the beginning of eBay. Basically, computers right now, you, you, they used to just follow simple rules and have completely predictive behavior. And right now we're kind of transitioning to more intelligent systems, as we can see in self-driving cars or algorithmic decision-making in finance, for example. So um, they are, we're giving more liberty to computers to uh, decide for themselves. And we, we might even be able to advance this more by just going into art, where as a human, you are, I believe, supposed to be completely free creatively and trying to transfer that to computing systems. And uh, that's kind of the interesting part because it goes, com I, I think it goes completely against what a computer used to be, namely these completely deterministic systems which just do the same thing over and over again. However, I have no interest to make a painting that's going to be run direct only by the robot. I actually find it very interesting to do something that, okay, it done something now, and I am reacting back to it. So I will go and I will do a, maybe a glaze on it. I will just go and give another a very, very gestural uh, brush strokes or splash of paint on it, something that the robot will not do, and see what it will create to the visual sphere. The lithography and monotype, they're all artistic tools that when they start to be used, they created slowly their own medium, their own, their own, their own aesthetic. The robot not only works as a printer, more like um a self-supervising or self-controlling machine that controls the painting process itself by analyzing uh, photos that it takes after some time. Uh, so this is a big difference to other painting machines that exist because most of these painting machines work more like printers because they pre-compute everything and just print it out. Yeah, our initial idea was that we can reproduce this kind of feedback loop. We were able to reproduce this using the machine, but now newer questions um, arose what the creative aspects are involved when humans paint. The small one is not as powerful and not, uh, not as frightening as the big one because uh, the big robot, it's, it's huge, it's got a lot of force and you can't really work alongside it because if, if it does the wrong movement you can really get hurt. You can just guide it to do something for you in your painting, like here, fill out this area so uh, you can do something else in parallel. the question what is creativity uh, is really interesting because we can't really properly define it and until we can define it we probably won't be able to put it into a computer so it, basically the combination of the, all the real world experience we have with some kind of you know inner world we have of our imagination to bring that we have to bring both of these 
into a computer and then there's some kind of process that combines it and yeah it, it somehow exists as a human you know it exists as I'm struggling you can't really put it into words or even a program A year time I was studying some Japanese calligraphy painting and there is something that I learned about it it was about the embodiment of the act it's about how you move your body and, and the use of uh, ink on rice paper it's something that you can barely control you always create the same kind of a pattern of how a flower should look like but you cannot control exactly how the ink will spread on the rice paper and you cannot erase or change it the thing that you need to focus on is how you move your body. It's not how you perceive what you see. And I think one of the most interesting uh, points for us was this, this discussion about control and loss of control in the act of making a painting. As for the computer scientists, the most important part is to control and to predict every little thing that the robot is doing. Most people that come here really think that we want to reproduce other artists, but that's not really what we want to do. We want to explore how um, artists in general work. Are there certain strategies that you can have for certain artists? And not really to copy artists. <laughs> Ja, weil es so, wenn, im Endeffekt ist es ja momentan eindimensional und eigentlich wäre so ein Beziehungspunkt ja auch, dass du eine Linie haben kannst. Ne? By actually programming a robot to paint with you and not for you, I think it's a very important uh, distinguish for me at least. Um, using the robot as, as a tool, as a painterly tool, it's something that helped me to understand where my conscious is part of it, where is my individuality is part of it, and where it's about the execution of different kind of uh, material. <laughs> Currently, in most of the cases, the machine works in fully automatic mode. And, and we are fascinated by that, yeah? You, you, um, you start with something on the next morning uh, after like 10, 12 hours of work, um, you get uh, an interesting result uh, in, in some cases. But my final goal would not be to let the machine paint by itself. Uh, instead, I, I would really like to work together with the machine. So my, my dream would be, like in an artistic process, I want to, to teach the machine in a very efficient way what I want uh, to have uh, on my on my canvas, so I I had to learn that the the best thing if an artist comes is um, to let the artist find its way with the machine. And as there is not many um, robotic paintings out there today, it's very hard for me to say, okay, this is the tool, this is what you do with it. I'm still trying to understand it. Um, so a huge part of it is to really to learn to let go of control and let the machine first of all to take me by the hand and tell me, okay, this is what I can do, let's go, cool. So I will do this and I will react to it and we slowly start to achieve, I would like to believe, a new language.
thank you very much for coming. Um, uh, we had this video so you could kind of see the robot in action. It's a bit difficult to actually get the machine uh, here to such a place to demonstrate it live. Um, quick, a quick introduction. For, uh, my name is Marvin Gülso. I am now a PhD candidate at the University of Konstanz. And my job mostly is to actually build the robot, program it, okay, not build it, we buy industrial robots, as you have seen, and then build the painting setup, um, and kind of provide a framework where either the machine can paint autonomously or we can have an artist uh, with us who works with the machine. I inherited, uh, in quotes, the project in 2018. Thomas Lindemeyer, who you saw in the video, he did most of the work up until now, and I'm picking it up now, more or less. And? Hi, uh, thank you again everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Diane Greiber, I'm a visual artist. And over the last years I've uh, been focusing on how we can actually work and practice image making in relation to the post-digital age we're living today. Namely, we overrun by so much imagery and what is the difference and why uh, painting is inherently different from um, actually seeing an image uh, digitally wise, uh, pixels and so on. And this is where I started collaborating with the University of Constance since 2016. Um, and during this exactly time, uh, the work in painting makes the subject matter of the entire work to be the process. So this is right now kind of the focal point of uh, my work. Um, um, now uh, quickly to go into the technical part, so how the machine works more or less. Uh, firstly, the name. It's a backronym for Electronic Drawing Apparatus for Vivid Image Display. So obviously we wanted to call it eDavid and then found something matching. Uh, we started it 10 years ago and it was really just that robot uh, in the basement. It had some wooden canvas in front of it where we tried to draw in some way. We started in felt tip. We moved uh, over to using ink brushes like Japanese calligraphy brushes and finally kind of graduated to um, regular painting with acrylic uh, paint on different kind of canvases and different kind of brushes. Um, we're doing it at, at the University of Constance, uh, as we said, in the department of computer graphics because it's, it's a bit difficult to find a home for such a project. If we did only robotics, painting would be a bit, you know, yeah, it's a nice application, but not the, not the point what we're getting at. And computer graphics is a bit of a sweet spot. The goals we want to achieve with this project are many. Uh, so one is autonomous painting. Ideally, we'd like to have to, the machine in a room, close the door, give it some instructions, then it produces a painting by itself. We can pick it up and it's done. That would be one aspect but also to provide some kind of a tool for the artists. So either as an assistant, as mentioned by the Herald, so we could have an artist who just makes a sketch uh, and the robot fills in all the tedious detail work so the artist can do something else in the meantime. Or, as Liat is doing, uh, figure out a completely different use we did not think about um, for this machine. Because as computer scientists we think as mentioned in the video, in terms of controlling this machine, how to do fine detail work, and not necessarily explore all the artistic possibilities. This project is a bit of a combination between engineering, robotics, computer science, art, and cleaning, because as you also see in the, in the background down there, um, having these robotics and paint which dries all over the place can get a bit annoying and cause some problems. We also have a mobile demonstrator for exhibitions, uh, not the small yellow one you saw, we got rid of that one, we now have a, about this tall um, robot by ABB, which we sometimes bring to exhibitions, it's still a lot of work, um, but maybe in the future uh, we, we, we can show it off somewhere nearby. Um, how the entire machine works is like this, we've got um, our canvas where all of the painting takes place, the robot knows it as its workpiece, and then um, by moving along certain points in the image and having a brush in its uh, gripper, it does produce some brush strokes. On the left, in the yellow and uh, green highlighted area, you can see our paint repository, which is just uh, a pot where the um, brush is held into uh, in some interval, um, picks up some paint, uh, discards uh, the excess, and sometimes you also clean it. Um, that's just a water jet where the brush gets, um, where all the old paint gets removed and we are ready to move to, over to another paint. The entire process is supervised by the camera, you see in the top left in blue. That's kind of what sets us apart from other painting robots that might exist. We have a feedback mechanism which can uh, supervise and adapt to some errors that might occur. 
Um, so here, in the top left, you can see what the robot in autonomous mode would start out with. It's just a normal JPEG. You would hand it to the robot and it would compute some kind of paint recipe and say, I want seven colors mixed in, the, in these ratios from some basic paints. I put it in these slots and then it can start painting. Initially, it just places some stroke to try to get certain areas to match the input image. So the blue sky, it will deposit a lot of blue strokes. The yellow um, sunrise area, it will take its yellow paint and put, um, put it over there. The initial results, of course, are not very good because we're trying to get ahead quickly. We're using a big brush. And, but after we uh, deposition some initial paint, we uh, create a difference image, which you can see in the top right. Um, in red, the areas the, ro uh, the robot considers it more or less complete, so it does it can't do much more to improve this area in terms of getting closer to the input image. But the green areas there, it can expect some more progress. So, for example, the sun, uh, the yellow area, is not bright enough, so it's uh, marked in green. While the beach in the front, um, it's dark-ish enough for this level of um, detail, so it just um, skips that area for now until it maybe moves on to a smaller brush. Based on that, we compute um, new strokes, which are a bit difficult to see, but this is our live debug output, which we can see while it's painting, um, which are then stored and executed in the painting process. And after repeating this many, many times, like over one day to sometimes even three days, we get a result like that on the left, which is kind of close to the input image, and we can definitely say we have reproduced that image in some way. Our early attempts using only the ink brush look like this. Um, here already we see some mixing, like long strokes for the tree and short strokes for the grass below it. This, of course, was done by masking. The robot doesn't really know what it's painting. It just um, fo follows our orders in this case. Um, and after, as, as I said, after the inks, we moved on to acrylic. And these are kind of our flagship examples, the best results we've got so far. Um, a building in the harbor of Constance and a car in the desert. And you can, see the, um, you can see the details which the robot has managed to achieve using its feedback mechanism. You can also see some problems we still have, like the antenna is a really small detail and our current mechanism, it's not perfect. Um, there are many issues in which it bump, bumps into and I also notice it's kind of an art to figure out what kind of input is good for the robot. So which, whether has it, does it have a chance to produce a good result? Because we do have a bunch of stuff we, would, um, we don't show, we kind of got rid of. Um, speaking of, uh, stuff we got rid of. <laughs> um, OK, so there was a kind of as a side effect happening while the robot is uh, operating in automatic modus. And beside the main painting it's actually creating, there is an extra paper. And on this paper, the robot has been programmed just to sweep extra paint that was being dumped. Uh, first, uh, the brush was going to take in paint. It's taking way too much. So it's going into like the small paper to make those side um, kind of a small brush uh, strokes. And I find these actually paper to be much more interesting than the painting itself that was being produced uh, by the system. As uh, someone who's coming from a different kind of a background, of painterly background, I always looked at those paintings and thinking, why would you like to do this? There was this, this uh, interest of, there is a technical uh, challenge, but there is as well the reason of why we do what we do. And I am coming from, uh, like I actually got educated in, in painting uh, department here in uh, Leipzig. It's a very classical uh, academy for painting in traditional European manner. And when I graduated, I remember like standing there and looking around thinking, hmm, it's all good, but where I am coming into this entire discourse, I'm coming uh, originally from the Middle East, I have a different kind of a background, cultural background that make you think, why do we adapt different kind of certain of aesthetics and how we walk around it? And one of the major questions that I uh, came to understand in my exploration is that what for me will make in a painting right now the most interesting is looking into different structures that shows logic in them. L rather, to be at the current stage, uh, more interesting than into going into narrative painting, namely things with, um, uh, let's say, semantic uh, evaluation, which is, I think, for the computer uh, part as well, very interesting. If the machine, how can you make the machine aware of uh, breaking the painting into narrative elements? This is a sky. This is a house. This is a bird. How they can actually be in, uh, taken apart together? So. 
looking at those works, I start actually taking those uh, pages and I interact with them. I edit some more unconscious kind of a brush strokes to go together, or like more gestural one to go on this like very structured one coming from the algorithm of the system. At the same time, the machine, uh, the paint is, is dripping. There is some kind of irregularity. So it's always about this small um, relation between things that have 100% organization and things that are a bit less. So if I would kind of try to think of a, a metaphor of it, it's like taking the painting realm and to track it as a, as a rubber um, that you, you kind of pull as much as you can till the point that, you know, if I will just stop pulling it right now, it have the strongest like uh, gravitation to, to each other back or it can actually snap and rip. And this is the point that I'm kind of investigating with the help of working uh, with the computer uh, graphic department. So this is just kind of uh, implementation that I start to understand that to actually, before you even go and start talking about painting, one needs to talk about the first thing that what painting is about, and this is a, about brush strokes, it's about lines. And this is the first thing of recording of movement. And we have today, in, oh, not today, for many years already, uh, the use of um, a computational uh, aesthetic and power in art, especially in music. However, there is something about the sound that it's been done and it's gone. And painting allows you to actually record every movement, to record every action, and to go above it and to manipulate on it. And I found these elements to be specifically interesting. And that was the base of the creation of some of my earliest work I've done in 2016, in collaboration with Thomas Lidenmeyer at the time at the University of Constance, um, where I took different kind of um, uh, parameters that goes very basic mathematical structures and to see how one can build different kind of um, all over composition. A lot of these works are actually be done on the Gestalt psychology uh, uh, writings, and I was just trying to take those ideas and translate them into basic mathematical equation and execute them into painting. The other uh, level that I start to investigate is the relation of a single brush stroke that you could have seen in the ones before in relation to actually how many brush strokes do we need to actually create a form and how that is being put in a compositional uh, area. So it's a very technical question, but at the same time, those structures are the ones that create and build our perceptions. You have when an element, when the individual strokes become a spot of pain, so when the, the one become a group, and how do we, like we understand, when we get to the point that we understand how we make the machine to understand those situations, and when to use different strategies when making painting back to be integrated in the visual feedback, more autom like, uh, autonomous uh, painting methods. Uh, another important part that uh, we worked on is how we can make the strokes to look more organic. So if you look in the right low, you can see that uh, the strokes are very straight, they're very, they look more mechanically done. So it's how can we introduce things that just a small deviation of the, the strokes or the, like the brush, not to go like 100%, like 90%, but a bit like this, and a bit like rotation, and uh, saying we want to make a, a spot of paint here, but don't make it directly, some things to go a bit out and begin. So all of those like, small details is something that, for me, are very important uh, in creating something that we as, as people can relate to and feel this is actually a work of art and not something mechanical and, and distant from us, is by increasing the fields of, of organic uh, representation. So this is like one of the, the work uh, play around that uh, I've done with Thomas in the beginning of my uh, um, residency. Uh, showing the work on the right is uh, done 100% by the visual feedback, while the second was being done according to breaking down uh, the entire concept of the painting into masks and using only three colors. So both of them are being done with the machine, just using different kind of strategies extracted from uh, this picture of these lovely guys that he does not even know that he's being shown here right now. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea who he is, actually. Lost to time. Yeah. Um, and that uh, developed to the work uh, that we have kind of funny idea. Let's make, of course, uh, what is like when you acknowledge a painter or like a, to be as an entity, then this is a question one can take as well into the art world uh, discourse, the commercial art world discourse. But there is the classic uh, self-portrait uh, of the painter. And this is a kind of the uh, preparation phase of how we done it. And that was going again into the strategy of actually breaking down the painting into uh, masks and given different strategies of how we do those paintings. So we actually base this entire work on a photograph that uh, then uh, I worked out a bit with GIMP and using the um, 
custom-made program that Thomas uh, built for me. I created uh, different kind of masking uh, strategies of uh, brush strokes to create the painting. So this is this, uh, uh, David uh, um, self-portrait, that uh, we find to be very uh, hilarious. He even uh, um, signed his name. And going back, like after I've done all of those work, I still had to this point of what makes a painting more interesting? Why are we still interested in it? Why in this time that we overrun and overload with, with visual imagery? Mm -hmm. uh, painting is still important. People are still going to learn painting. We still do that. And I'm always like, tricky between the elements of making and the elements of, obs of the perception of how we see it. Um, and that was like a kind of... Um, this work was built on the idea of... Um, uh, like, how would I say, like the action of making uh, a structure of just a stroke. It's a very doodle-looking uh, structure that uh, was done by the computer and something that is still complex enough for a human being not to be able to repeat. Only a machine can do it, but the deviation, the, the changes and the uh, variation of the work is actually being uh, consumed or, or created through the use of paint. So how often uh, the robot takes uh, paint, more or less, and then just make it feel, oh, this, it feels like it was being painted quicker, but it was actually a bit drier, the, the brush. So how one can make those like, small manipulation and tricks for uh, the creation of painting only in the domain of a brush stroke? Speaking of brush strokes, um, what we have currently, as you can see, we are kind of painting in always similar style. We have got a brush, we apply it in the, at the same pressure level to a canvas, then we get some paint transfer and that's how we create our images. Um, because it's very difficult for a robot to actually handle a brush. We don't have a tool center point, which everything ro rolls around in, in, in these machines. But usually you have a welding gun, you know exactly to the millimeter here the effect of my tool will be localized. Um, but brushes, they deform, not transform, that shouldn't, shouldn't happen, they get dirty, it's really difficult to simulate a brush because of these many hairs. Uh, they vary their properties when they get wet and so on. Um, and the provided software we have for handling tools in robots only works with these hard, uh, hard tools, basically, not soft tools like brushes. Um, and that's a problem for our painting and also what we can provide to the artists as a control element in here in the painting process. Because, for example, it's difficult to define a certain edge in a painting. The painting process will draw over it many times, and since the brush deviates a bit every time, um, the corner will just blur out. Hence, we can't do many details, and we don't really know the side effects a movement generates. So if you take your brush, move it up, and then perform a sharp corner, it will slide around on the, on the canvas a bit uh, and produce a certain effect. We, we can't control for that yet. So uh, our solution, for a stopgap solution uh, in the first iteration, is to actually measure, measure what our tools can do in terms of width and lagging behind. So if you look at a brush like this, um, we, we think we have a nice defined tool center point, but as soon as you apply it, obviously, it blurs out like that, it deforms, it might stay like that. And as a funny side note, if you overdo it with the robot and have some sign errors, you deform it permanently. Um, so our solution to this problem is doing this. Um, we have some automatic procedure. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically the robot can paint uh, strokes at known pressure levels, which we limit to avoid what I showed you previously. And then we can use our feedback mechanism to measure how broad a certain stroke gets at which pressure, pressure level. And using this, we can accurately um, uh, reproduce strokes. For example, in this case, um, we can account for width. We can also uh, if a human paints the stroke you see on your left with the red center line, we can record it using our feedback mechanism and paint some first attempt, li like we do normally, uh, with the yellow center line. Then we try to figure out what went wrong when painting this, where our brush might be lagging behind, where we're not applying too much enough pressure and so on. We compute some correction and can uh, perform the stroke again. This happens over several iterations, and in the end, we can see a quite nice end result. But here you see there's already a big improvement between our initial attempt and what we can actually produce. And by storing these strokes, um, we can kind of build up a database of knowledge over time, which then artists can use to tell the robot, hey, put stroke number 25 in this exact location, thus enabling much finer grain control. 
and kind of um, as a party trick by just reproducing single strokes and writing in a funny way, we can also make the robot just repeat your writing a bit, like a medieval monk, if you so will. Um, yeah, and single strokes. Um, so, as you can see, like our work uh, has changed the material. Uh, before, uh, the work was being uh, done a lot with uh, acrylic painting, means that you can work in layering. And in order to really... Um, control and to master the way of doing the uh, brush strokes, we decided to move back into working more with ink and, uh, and paper, where we can actually have the ability to see every stroke into its details and to understand how we can control it better, how can we pursue uh, better what we want to achieve. Uh, this is just an example to see the entire kind of spread of a stroke um, using different kind of um, of points, just saying, okay, we have uh, just the time in the the second one, just the time how long you're just standing, so just to see how the material is reacting. So we are talking here about not only uh, the computer itself and the stroke, but actually the material itself. The, the paint is reacting if the brush is a bit too wet, it's actually expand more into the paper, uh, a bit less or a bit more, like the gradients of the color is changing according to how often it's actually dipped into paint, so in this situation, it was uh, dipped every 80 strokes in paint, but every 10 strokes in water. So the water as well that is slowly diluted, and um, and the paint got as well diluted. And there was kind of situation uh, of gradients that happened uh, through those kind of a system that goes to us in the end as viewers. And together uh, for this uh, work, uh, Marvin had here had uh, built this uh, uh, software for me that generated particles. And those particles are actually being created uh, due to Newton's law of gravity. Um, I just decided to use this as a general law of how we can spread structure, how things are operating in space. If I'm looking at the painting as a, as a space of, of creation, like in the world, and we can scale it into different situations and different sizes, uh, take only elements from it. Um, and I use actually this work to create uh, an entire installation build from many elements and to ex execute it, uh, different parts. So again, this entire work was being done uh, using ink and uh, rice paper. Here, just to show you again the differences of how just using a different brush make the outcome to be definitely just totally different, although it's the same section, it's the same uh, information that was being given into the robot for painting. Uh, the fact that the robot is not aware of the material he's working with, a lot of situations happens where the material is getting dis like really deformed. What probably as a trained artist, I would think it's maybe wrong, or maybe I should not do it, or I will try to avoid it, and f the robot is not aware of those situations, but it's actually allow us a new way to handle with materials, to, to see, oh, it's actually an interesting uh, situation to have those holes happening in the papers, like what happened when it's too, too much uh, going over the line. So those work were being created, I think, 20-something uh, uh, rice paper work that I uh, painted, taken from this uh, um, particle generator and being hanged in a room in an installative way. It's given us the point, again, to observe painting not as one big thing that you have to look simultaneously, but actually forcing the viewer to walk by it and to stop and to look about every little element and to understand and discover the process of making it, so making the process uh, much more visible. Uh, this work, again, uh, was being later developed into how one can exhibit the work, so to go outside of the painting from just things that is flat on the wall and to take it out into the space. Uh, so therefore, there was a decision of uh, framing those works in double sides, uh, using um, uh, hanging frames, and you can actually look at and see them from the side it was being painted, and the side it was being uh, just absorbed, and creating a spatial area where one can work uh, and experience the process of the creation and not only the finished object as a painting. So that's kind of uh, where we're at today. Um, but the project is, of course, going to uh, continue and be developed further over time. One major ar area from my side I want to work on is painting technique. So right now we've got one style we can do well, um, but of course it would be better if we could more emulate what a human actually does. A human does not stand in front of his canvas and play stroke after stroke in random places. 
Um, we would like to make the robot scribble on the surface, mix some strokes deliberately, maybe perform dabs, and vary that style within one painting, maybe, as is appropriate. Um, of course, getting a machine to actually do that requires a lot of um, input uh, of certain movements, and it, it's a bit tricky. Also, I mentioned the database of movements we'd like to build, so we know, okay, this movement will give us this exact result, so we have a much more predictable um, process and something you can pick and choose from and maybe even tell the robot, okay, only focus on this type of stroke instead of this, so you can, in the end, guide its style in a much more concrete way than right now, where you can only vary stroke length and stuff like that. Also, our, our system design, you saw a bit um, of the development, we started out using a plastic bucket with uh, some grid in it to clean the, clean the brush. Uh, we're moving on, prototyping as we go on, and trying to develop better hardware so the robot can actually have clean tools, uh, safe tool changes, and so on. Also, openness is a, bit, is a problem at the moment, and it's a bit difficult to get other code into our project or to just get, get strokes from somebody else he would like to have executed on the machine. So we are reworking uh, the software architecture to make, to make it possible for other collaborations because it turns out we've got uh, competition in some way, in a good way, in Turin, I think. There's also a, a painting robot being developed at the university. We are co cooperating with Shenzhen University who are kind, kind of reproducing our robots and then we have two of these systems to work with in different places. Also, because I have to mention it, machine learning. Um, we need to figure out if it makes sense to actually use machine learning in our approach, if there is some easy way um, to, uh, to do it. Um, is it possible to maybe simulate some creative aspects, you know, these Google Deep Dream thingies, could we take that technology, get out some strokes and have, uh, have it output on our machine? And the uh, interesting side note, who actually gets copyright if we, allow to do the if we allow the machine to do more and more by itself? So at some point we had a law professor in our lab and um, he asked how much are we still doing in this process? Because once the machine starts doing enough and reaches what in, in German law is called Schöpfungshöhe, I think, uh, it will get difficult to attribute to who actually owns the painting which is being created. And some fu future issues for Liat. Um, okay, so the work that we're being done, uh, we're still working on, uh, stopped for me right now in the moment of how can I use this uh, tool to extend myself? It means how can I go beyond the limitation of myself as a human being, what I can do, first of all, for my own perception, because when I'm standing in front of a, can a canvas or a painting surface, I'm looking from one place. My brushstrokes ability is only limited to my side of my arms. So I would like to integrate more into those kind of elements to see how can we use this tool to create maybe a larger scale works. At the same time, uh, idea of how one can uh, translate data taken from different elements into the painting, so the painting will become an abstract representation of maybe social structure if we take it from uh, movement uh, data that uh, I'm right now collaborating with the Casa Paganini in, uh, in Genova, taking data from uh, behavioral uh, movement information and using individual human beings actually to be translated into brush strokes. Um, further, it's the idea of how the machine could become more and more organic in its behavior. So it's not only the way it looks, but the way it works and operates. So right now it works very deterministic ways. Like if you give it a, a JPEG, it works from it according to uh, the parameter it's being given, or it's giving through a deterministic way of um, an algorithm and being given and just being uh, filling it up. I would be very interesting to get to the point where the machine will integrate what considered to be um, a mistake in the painting process, something that we didn't expect it to happen, we didn't want it to happen. But it's there now and it's changed the entire world situation, so how can we integrate and react to each other so the, convers the conversation that's happening between me and the machine is actually therefore opening a new realm for creativity because there is something almost objective that comes from this kind of an input that makes me question myself of my decision-making process and my habits of visual information. Um, yeah, that's kind of what we have to say so far. Uh, if you want to figure out more about the project, we've got a website from the university. If you want to see more of Liat's artwork, she has got a website as well. And what we presented uh, today, more or less, the stroke thingies, you can uh, see in our latest publication at MDPI, 
self-improving robotic brushstroke replication. A professional would have added the link here, but um, we added that last minute, I'm sorry. But you can, you can find it easily. I have to use the term. You can easily Google it, sorry. Um, yeah, that's our talk so far. If you've got any questions, I guess now is the time. Ah. Super. Great. I'm actually wondering how you make a robot really ship. At a certain moment, you have something like, hey, come on, let me get into this, because, isn't it? Uh, because that kind of communication would be interesting. With an assistant, you just kick it, and it, he or she goes away. But E, David. It could kill you if you actually disturb it <laughs> well, by working. The thing has a lot of power. That's experience we have in our <laughs> hackerspace as well. We have a diamond cutting thing, and there the thing. Oh drops sometimes whatever we have lots of questions i assume really start number two please hey thanks for the talk uh, if i understood correctly it's not a printer because you get more because you get visual feedback yes okay so i'm wondering um what how does it actually can you scale uh, beyond just visual feedback i mean there are a lot of different ways uh, but is it feasible and that what would be the consequences because it could be another social feedback by, for example, us or the public or the audience uh, judging the result. I mean, there are so many ways. So how is, it how is it feasible, practically speaking? What are the consequences? So the question is, can we introduce some other feedback other than just vis visual information? Uh, yeah, higher level, more yeah. conceptual. Well, more. Yes, you could. So in theory, we, we don't have it at the moment, obviously. But if we had a way for somebody to kind of give the robot an overlay and say this corner isn't good, it's kind of deviates from my optimum by a certain value, then we, are, we would also need some function to determine how it should improve that and then we could also include other kinds of feedback of any kind basically. The trick is always to find a function which describes how big the error is for the feedback and what can be done to fix it. In cases of just black or white or color, color spaces, it's kind of easy. If, it, if it's too gray, you paint more uh, white color over it. But in here, it gets difficult, but it might be doable. Or, do you have any views on that? Well, I think it's, there is a lot of challenges to use of the uh, visual feedback, because there is the question always of perception. When the visual feedback that what is actually getting right now, it's from a photograph, where everything is being scaled equally, and there is certain kind of parameters it's checking. It's uh, what Marvin just said about uh, the darkness, uh, the level of uh, areas, and so on. And it still does not have the tuning of understanding, for example, semantic uh, uh, situation to say, oh, here I painted the, the tree as part of the, the sky and it's supposed to be two different things. This is, I think, the interesting part for us as human beings to interact and slowly teach the machine and see what it's doing and correct it. And hopefully, like slowly, the machine will remember through its doing um, to get to a more defined or uh, abilities of feedbacks that are probably much more developed from what we have right now. I would love to see a live demonstration here. Uh, number one, please shoot. Thank you for this very inspirational talk. I actually got several questions, but I will limit myself to one. two if it's one, possible. One, 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 one. So first question is, um, could you please elaborate a little bit more on this aspect of cleaning? Since you said it's a combination of art, robotics, and cleaning. Uh. And... Then question number two would be about yeah what what would for each of what was for each of you like the most surprising in this project and cooperation? Yeah. Okay, so the first question was what what's all this about cleaning I mentioned? Basically yes. it, I mentioned it so much because it's my major headache in this automation process right now. <laughs> cleaning. Because over time when the robot paints a lot with that brush some stuff dries, some stuff just it sticks in the brush and it's really difficult to get out. Then you contamin contamin uh, contaminate your other paints and everything tends towards some gray, brownish stickiness. I think as well it's the differences of, of how computer science are used to work in certain kind of a lab and suddenly they have a, an atelier happening there. Yes. So when I was there for me it was like actually it's a, clinic, it's a fairly clean studio here. Yeah, so I think it's, it's a lot of a matter of, yeah. of habits but of course when you work with, uh, with machinery and you work uh, in, in a scientific environment you need to measure everything so keeping a clean 
environment is important to actually follow about the results. And that, I think, one of the reasons why it's such a big headache for uh, Marvin in this. Uh, wouldn't it be better to come over to the atelier then with your robot, since that's the uh, atmosphere and environment? Two different uh, cities that's too far away yes. from each other. Yeah, we, we try that one. This one. Uh, and also another problem is if you see the table with the colors on the left, there's also a magazine where the robot can s uh, swap out brushes. And once too much paint had accumulated in there, um, the tool did not properly enter the, the slot. Uh, it was misaligned. The robot then almost threw over the table when trying to uh, switch tools. Yeah. So that it's also just a mechanical problem after some time. But the floor uh, doesn't look like an atelier here? E no, I think, yeah, y y when you're there, you see a lot more. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. And the next question was, should we do the second one? or? What was the most surprising, was the surprising part of oh, yeah, surprising. I, I'll be quick. When I entered the project, I was like, do we have a robot? Yes. Can I work with it? Yes. Uh, do you want to know what we do? No. Um, <laughs> and then I figured out, oh, this art part exists. I had no, no connection with it at all. And that was kind of surprising for me to be, be stumble into this uh, world, uh, which, which also is included in the project. We can Im imagine a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> Number two, please shoot. Uh, oh, oh. Yes. Oh, yeah, the surprise. Yeah. Um, I, I think for my side, it's very similar to uh, from uh, maybe my Marvin parts, because when I came there, I thought, OK, it's going to be weird. coming from a very different world. How can we discuss uh, very similar issues? And it was a pleasant uh, surprise to discover that we have similar questions. And we look into the world into very similar ways, but the tools that we are doing and the perspective that we're doing is very different. So the attempt of trying to communicate those two was, for me, the most interesting part. And just looking into structure to understand how can I use computer language, structural uh, language, to actually build painting and how similar and close to each other those two are. Organizing chaos or chaosizing organizations, something like that. Huh? Entropy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please, sir. I, can, can the robot make use of some tactile feedback, for example, pressure sensor in the brush? Um, we don't have it, and it's, it's very difficult because we, the forces that should be occurring are very small and might also change because of stuff accumulating. Um, and also, as soon as we introduce a wire into a brush, for example, to measure something, that will change the outcome. Um, so no, but we are thinking about maybe having some live supervision of the brush with, with the camera. Um, but then you get the problem of a green brush on a green background and trying to separate that. It's, it's difficult. So we're still painting more or less bl uh, blind in that regard. If you have a solution, come up and yes. hand it over. Number two, one, number one, please. Uh, as an artist, experimentation is very important to try and Experiment, experimentation is very important to try out n new things, to you know, do things that you maybe didn't plan to do and so on and so on. What happens if uh, E. David gets a brush that it doesn't know? If there's a tool in the, in the toolbox that it picks up and then just applies it to the canvas? I actually done that with it several times and it just makes the, it just make it uh, keep painting, if, especially when you work with the visual feedback because things happen that you didn't expect it to happen. So the machine thinks it's wrong, I will just do it again and it could keep probably paint like this for eternity because uh, it, it doesn't have this like, you know, uh, experimentation in something that you can tell to a human because then I experiment something new and I understand something from the process and I'm learning from it. The machine is still not in the situation that it's learned. It has a goal, it has its tools, and it's now how can I use those tools to achieve my goal. It doesn't understand swearing or something like that. No, uh, no but sometimes I do swear at him or, yeah, you, I, or I, I show imagine. love to him. It, it depends, yeah. uh, <laughs> but it helps to my psychology. We have a couple of more but minutes. Uh, number right, right, right. It's very interesting what you say because obviously it's dangerous because the machine does not have much sensory feedback. But if we do it in some controlled way, well, it knows limits, so it must be constrained in that way. We could definitely implement methods where it just paints randomly, records it, and then somehow uses it in some further experiment. Yeah. Paint Number two, shoot, shoot. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have uh, two more of art historical questions. Um, first, uh, the notion of the painter, right? The notion of the artist as painter is um, a notion that is like marked with a lot of um, markers of gender, for example, like the man that paints, but also of virtuosity, of authorship, and things like this. Have you 
think about like um, dealing with robots with other media that isn't marked this way or maybe with painting but differently or how can one change this notion that kind of gets repeated and um, also I was wondering uh, moment <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was wondering about um, uh, people like Jean Tingerly, like uh, people that would de were dealing with machines already, I don't know, in the 50s or something, but they uh, understand themselves as, as sculptures too, like they were producing a machine that was mechanical and that was painting, like a painting machine. And of course, what you're doing is differently since it's a robot, but how, like if you relate to that tradition. Thank you. Um, so the, for the first uh, question, uh, for I am a painter, and it's important for me to state it, although for according to my academia where I studied, they consider it not to be a painting anymore because it's not exactly done by the authorship of a human being. Although I'm working with uh, paint and brushes, I was being sent directly into a video audio department when I wanted to produce to show this project. And I was like, I, there is no audio video in the work. Why are you sending me there? Um, so when it comes to using different media, for example, now uh, the project I was doing in Italy was working with um, using digital representation and uh, different levels of visualization that I found interesting. But to be honest, for me, the interaction with real materials is the most important part. And using uh, the machinery right now is an extension of how one can use technology for its own creativity. So how we, we change, like, so I, I'm trying to see it in the relation of uh, art history as an opportunity to establish a new aesthetic and not to go into the discussion of authorship, although it needs to be there and it has to be there. Because of course, when the camera was introduced, photography introduced like uh, in the beginning, considered not to be even art and it was very low valued because uh, the machine done it, not the person. Today, the discussion is not there anymore. So I think there is this freedom that uh, I have right now in this domain because I don't have the Alte Meister to sit and look and upon and to say I have to imitate those like uh, old European men and the way they've been painted because it's new. So I can do whatever I want and no one can tell me it's right or wrong and this is a great privilege. Um, for the second question about the way of presentation, I will still go back to the say I am a painter and for that I'm interested in the image itself and I think there is the fetishism of the machine, especially today when you see the robots and people don't even care what it's doing. They see a robot moving, it's like, whoa, it's so cool. And it's nice and I think you can do a lot of things in uh, levels of uh, interaction works. And, um, but I am really not into this. Like it's, I, I'm, not in, I'm not a performative artist. I'm not interested in uh, making a kinetic art. I'm more into really just how can you represent the movement in the still, in the still image, and how that could, in a way, fight back against the overload of visual imagery we have today. Because we maybe look at the painting for three seconds, we get it, we go on. Like as a visual artist today, I'm being required to know who are my contemporary fellows. I cannot be at the same time in Hong Kong and in New York and in. Paris, so I check them out in my shitty phone, and I see this image, and I'm like, oh, I get what it's done there, and I'm continuing. So it's a different way of experiencing information, and I want to use this machine as a way, as a tool, to communicate back what the information coming from the machine, from the computer that we are all uh, using right now, and reconnect and recommunicate with real materials again. Yeah, almost in the factory of Warhol. But uh, <laughs> number one, please, we have just okay. a couple of minutes left. Uh, yeah, so thank you also from my side. A very interesting talk. And I'm very curious about the machine learning side of things. So, of course, there you would need to define something like a cost function or a loss function, which describes how well the system is progressing. And I'm wondering, both artistically and scientifically, how would you go about, what are you thinking about defining such cost or loss or quality functions? Yeah. Um, that's what, exactly what I'm working on right now and what's giving me nightmares because it is very, di no, very difficult. You try to reduce the problem and then you already Im impose extreme limits on the machine. So what would, maybe, what would maybe be a good first step, because at the moment we do no learning at all in the current setup, um, would be reinforcement learning and just have the machine approximate some kind of template 
and maybe afterwards we could say certain class of stroke is aesthetic in some way, but it, it gets very vague and difficult. So we'll, we'll figure that out in the future, I hope. But also, I guess, artistically, it's a very interesting question, right? Have you talked about it? How you define those questions? This is uh, always a qu like what is wrong and what is right in the arts. What is, so it's, it's an issue. <laughs> if, if we find something, I think it would be troubling. If we could say, yeah, this old painting is 85% aesthetic. Yeah, but I think there is today a, a huge amount of studies uh, that I found, uh, like in our science, that I found a bit scary, to be mm -hmm. honest. That trying to quantify th those those elements, and one cannot look at it as an absolute because it's all it depends on the place and the time and the history that you are coming from, and this is a huge challenge that we are facing today, as we all live in this like, global society, and everything is flattening out, and everything has been done and been taught in art academies across the globe are kind of similar. So I found it to be very dangerous, and this is why, for me, this working with the machine is not about giving it the autonomy, but using it as a tool to maybe even like learn its individual user. So maybe we can create uh, several kind of uh, users, and each uh, user learn, the machine will learn the habits of its user, and therefore would continue into a relative absolute uh, values, I would say. I really have to apologize because we have to close this session. I'm looking forward to these new chapters of artistic uh, behavior in humanity. Uh, I suggest to continue these uh, uh, speeches uh, afterwards somewhere here in a car, in a bar, or yeah, you will be, will be available here. I would love to thank uh, Liat, uh, Marvin, E. David, of course, and Professor Deutschen, that's the name, huh? isn't it? Please, thank you. To